it might be a good idea to point out that, that uh, I can't assume that I know everyone. My name is David Graycheck. I'm the pastor of the church. Your bulletin reads, my good friend Spencer Von Gulick. Spencer was to be here today um, as I have been recovering from spine surgery that I had a couple weeks ago. But Spencer had pneumonia and was put in the hospital. So in our prayers today, I want us to remember Spencer and I want us to be praying for Spencer. He's a good man with a good heart. And we want to be sure that he's strong to do the work that God would have for us. So with that, let me, let me pray before we get started this morning. Loving God, we thank you so much for your servant, Spencer. We thank you so much for his love for you and for this, this community. Lord, strengthen him, be with him. As we prayed earlier, take the diseases away, that he may be strong for all that you would have him do. Loving God, I would ask that you open our eyes and open our ears so that we might clearly hear and clearly see what you have brought before us in this text today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So when I talked to Michelle on Friday, and I learned that the Spencer wasn't feeling very well, I thought to myself, well, what, what do we talk about coming up Sunday? What are the texts that Spencer had planned for us to use? And, and it seemed to be pretty fitting. Um, psalm 139 is, is a beautiful psalm. If you ever find yourself in a difficult spot, Maybe you're in, you're in a difficult place by actions you've done or you just don't quite understand. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, I have had put, pasted to my desk for years. Search me. So I want to start with something that I read earlier. Um, actually, it was just, I don't remember if it was just before or after. It must have been just after my surgery. It was a poem by Yango Li about vulnerability. It said, vulnerability is not being weak, but being open, allowing you to become more than a stone shrouding, waiting to crumble, to talk and accept your most painful fears, thoughts, experiences, memories, scars. To do so is true bravery. Is not being thought of less, but to being willing to change when necessary, to own those weaknesses and purge them into strengths. So that one day you can help others find a place where the only road is not so dark, where a vulnerable heart will stand forever. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love. And I don't, I can't say that I can claim the title to that. I read a book um, by Dr. Brene Brown called Daring Greatly. She was the one that came up with that idea. She did her research work on vulnerability. She spent 10 years studying vulnerability. That's being pretty vulnerable. But she defines it in her book as, as the vulnerability as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. This is where she coined vulnerability as the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. If we want greater clarity in our purpose or deeper or meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability, she claims, is the path. Vulnerability is the core of of all emotions and feelings. Now, if you've ever thought about vulnerability like I have before, I'm not so excited about vulnerability. I do what I can to avoid vulnerability. Most do. It's possible that vulnerability is the gateway to love. Webster's defines vulnerability as the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. So it would be easy to understand why vulnerability is not the first place someone wants to hang out, someone wants to live. Yet, is it possible that it's the birthplace of love? 
as Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown suggests? Scripture teaches us that God is love. 1 John 4, 8. So assuming if Dr. Brown is onto something here, which I believe she is, living in a posture of vulnerability opens us up to God. God is love. Yet still, somehow or other, it isn't the world's favorite thing to do. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I had surgery on my spine. And if you know me at all, when I get nervous, I get chatty. Just ask Stacy; she'll tell you that. But as I went in that morning, first off, I, I prayed with Spencer, so I appreciated Spencer being there. Um, I was getting prepped for my surgery by a, a young lady named Sam, Samantha. And we got to talking and chatting, and this was before the med, so it was a real conversation. God knows where it goes after that. But she told me all about her getting married on December 3rd, and we talked about that, and we were excited about that. And she told me how remarkably nervous she was. And I said, that's not that far away. Tell me about your nervousness, and she's doing all of her, her prep things. And I asked her if it would be okay if I prayed with her about that. And, and she agreed, so we stopped what we were doing, and we prayed for her marriage. Not long after she was there, they allowed Stacy to come into my little prep room before I went into surgery, and the surgeon came in, and, and he's, he's very thorough. He told us everything he was going to do. And I'm like, I hope you don't think I'm supposed to remember that. But again, before all the meds took place, I asked him, uh, sir, can I pray for you? And Stacy held my hand, and the surgeon then held my hand, and I prayed for the surgeon and his team. Somehow, in that, that vulnerability that I was feeling, maybe it's the gown that you know opens in the back that nobody likes, it introduced to me that remarkable sense of vulnerability, and it just seemed the right thing to do to pray with those whose hands my life was being put into. Friends, I want to suggest that doesn't make me special in any way at all. But it does make a loving God who sees you where you are and in that moment says, I've got this, I've got you, and I've got these folks that are going to be caring for you. I appreciated that moment. In fact, in talking with the, the surgeon and the, the nurse later, they appreciated the moment because they understood that we were about to enter into something that it was bigger than them, than me, than all of us. And I'm forever grateful for that. But I want to suggest that we don't need to be headed into surgery to have this feeling in our own lives every day. As I found that morning, I was given opportunities to experience God's grace and God's love flow through to people that love the Lord. Embracing vulnerability, it felt, brought me closer to God more than anything else. More than the imminent danger that I feared, even though it was just a surgery. Brene Brown shares in her book that there's a friend of hers that her name is, is Gay Gaddis. She owned this think tank. She called it T3. She took her $16,000 that she had an IRA and she poured it into a group and she created an ad agency out of this think tank. And, and she was one that she turned it into a multi-person company, hundreds of people that she employed then. And it was all women-owned. But she made the statement that says, when you shut down vulnerability, you also shut down opportunity. She wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet so many people and create so many opportunities for others had she not stepped into the vulnerability of her own life when she started that company. Is it possible that our best opportunities to live the Christian life come from the posture of vulnerability? I guess, as you might imagine, I'm suggesting it is. Paul teaches us in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I mean, I read that as I can't do a ding-dong thing apart from God. It doesn't take a special person to pray with a couple folks before surgery. It takes a special God to remove obstacles that we fear. 
I asked Chris to have this flower pasted on the screen for us during the entire service. Of all the things in God's kingdom, I, I, I think of the flower as one of the most vulnerable. I know so because I'm good at killing them. But they grow. A tulip spends its night every night closed up, and when the light comes out, it opens to the sun. A sunflower. Now you know what I've been doing at home. This is in my kitchen. Turns itself and follows the sun across the sky, and at the end of the day will be facing the west. The most vulnerable things in creation, it seems, and I'm sure there's more vulnerable, so I can't claim it's the most, but very vulnerable things in our world, beautiful things, flowers, are open to the light of God. They focus on the light of God to show their beauty. Friends, you and I are made in the image of God. And all we're being asked to do is to focus on on the light. Focus on the loving God who is. David is teaching us in this psalm what it is like to do that. Psalm 139. Entering into a state of vulnerability is how David comes to understand the deep intimate relationship he needs in the chaotic out of control life that he lived. David's a man after God's own heart, but he's pretty good at getting in places he has no business getting into. But he comes to understand. He says right away in the first verse, Lord, you have searched me. You have searched me. You have known me. He recognizes the all-knowing God is all-powerful, but he doesn't leave it there. He brackets the whole statement in suggesting, search me, God. In verse 23, he closes it out with, search me, know me, lead me, know me. God, know everything there is to know about me. Show me what isn't right and lead me in that way that you have promised that you will. Lead me in that way that only you can. God, keep doing what you've been doing in all my life, but help me to get rid of the stuff that I hold on to, the things that aren't about you. Help me, loving God. Search me. David wants to go deeper. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. Examine me. Investigate me. Trust me. Test me. Prove me. Can you imagine asking for more vulnerable things than that? David wants a soul-searching, a soul-cleansing, intimate relationship with a loving God. And then finishes with, lead me, guide me. God, I don't know how to lead my life the way you do. I will never know the right way to go unless you lead me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. David realizes, I need you leading me in that way. Help me, Lord, to be vulnerable. I read a story about a pilot who was speaking on focus on the family. The pilot was flying a uh, fighter jet in bad weather and about to make his instrument approach to an airport. The air traffic controller called and asked, how much full fuel do you have? And the pilot responded, plenty. Well, the controller said, we've got a little problem. There's a young pilot who is not instrument rated. He's lost in the clouds, and we were wondering if you could intercept him and lead him back to the airport. Sure, the pilot responded. He found the lost plane and pulled up beside it. He called on the radio and told the pilot to look out to his left. When the pilot of the small plane saw the powerful jet, he burst into tears of relief. As far as he was concerned, his life was about over. He would soon run out of fuel and crash. The test pilot says, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to pull in front of you several hundred yards, do everything I do 
when I turn, I'll turn gently. All you have to do is exactly what I do. So carefully, the leader and follower turned toward the airport and slowly descended. When they broke through the clouds at 500 feet, the frightened pilot saw the most beautiful sight. There in front of him was the runway, and he was perfectly set up to land. He wouldn't have made it back had he not had the right guide. In David's chaotic life, his prayer is that he won't make it back unless God shows him, unless God guides him. Jesus took our sins on the cross. He died for us. And now this risen Savior, through the gift of his spirit, wants to help us be guided back to a loving God that will be there even in our most intimate, vulnerable moments. My friends, my prayer for you today, my encouragement for us today is to individually, not in a group, it's too scary to do that, is pray Psalm 139 for yourself. Pray that God would accept you in your most vulnerable moment, getting rid of the worst things that maybe have happened in your life that you hold on to, that God says, I already know about that. I want you to let go of that. And then be guided to a loving God. This is the love we take out into our community. This is what we do on a regular basis when we get together and we love others to love Christ. Thank you, David. We get to come around a table that is not unlike any other table. It's a table for a meal. But the beautiful thing is that we share this meal, this simple meal, with our brothers and our sisters around the world. And it's where we come to understand and to sort of own in our own way God being a part of us and us being a part of God. Jesus in us and us in Jesus. Christ dwelling with us, within us and pouring through us. It's what we celebrate with this meal. Thank you.